Today is quite hectic in the Karagandi Ecology Museum, as it is from here where the International Zoological Expedition will start. Within the framework of the Kazakhstan Argali Conservation Initiative Project, IUCN experts and the staff of the Territorial Fauna Inspections will go to Karaganda and eastern Kazakhstan regions to monitor wild animal populations in selected model sites. Special attention will be paid to mountain sheep or argali. In the course of the next three weeks, the Odo KZ Permanent TV Expedition will accompany the researchers in their journey and adventures. The Karaganda Ecology Museum was established 20 years back by local geologists, geochemists and biologists who wanted to share their knowledge on the environmental issues of central Kazakhstan and potential solutions with the public and authorities. The main mission of the Eco Museum is to promote environmental or eco culture as an integral part of general culture in Karaganda region. It's hard to separate eco-culture from, for example, civilized land use, hunting and fishing culture, ecotourism or economic culture. The bicycle was left here by a traveling couple from Australia. They designed it themselves, traveled on it across Central Asia, China and Mongolia. In January, they reached Karaganda, but it was very cold here, and they were forced to stop their expedition. They decided to leave their bicycle in the museum. From its very inception, the museum has attracted quite a robust group of environmentalists in love with the nature of their native land. Currently, they participate in various research projects. I came to the museum in 2016. In fact, I was invited by Dmitry Yevgenievich to work with foreign students. These are Michael Thompson and Tanya Frank. Together with them, we went across Kakarali district of Karaganda region to study the relationship between the wild nature and local population. Our Rico Museum is not a dedicated biodiversity research establishment, but we deal with animal protection from various adverse factors, like human activities or, say, industry. For instance, we investigated the impact of the current situation at the Semipalatinsk test site on the size of animal populations. I was invited to take part in the Argani accounting project in Karaganda region, specifically in the Semerol Vostochnaya, or Northeastern in English, hunting farm, with the expert group led by Stefan Mika. He's an international expert in hoofed animals. Since I'm working in the biodiversity department of the Eco Museum, I got very interested in the idea. It's a great chance for me to master wild animal counting techniques. The expedition's route goes through the mountain massives of Yadre, Arkalik and Mezhek in Kakarali district. They are just a few tens of kilometers away from the former Semipalatinsk test site. How does it affect the wild animal livestock? My grandparents are from the Yadre area, from Kakarali district. In fact, I was born there too and would go there every summer in my childhood. It's very beautiful there. This area is of huge importance for the overall nature of Kazakhstan, for the environment and for wild animals. In 1949, at the Semipalatinsk test site, on border of Karaganda, Semipalatinsk and Pamlada regions, the USSR tested its first nuclear bomb. The bomb with the highest explosive capacity of 400 kilotons was blown up in 1953 at the height of 30 meters above ground. The buffer area around the test site included vast farmlands. People did not want to live near the test site, even in the areas not included in the buffer zone and where radiation pollution did not exceed the admissible level. Well, 
часто бывали. Если честно, я Архара очень близко не видела. Я знаю многих людей, которые... When kids, we went there quite often. Frankly, I've never seen an Argani up close, but I know those who saw them in the Yarkar Lake, Yedre and Mejik Mountains. Before, there were a lot of them. But the 90s turned out quite hard. Back then the population had suffered much from poaching, and now it's gradually restoring, including thanks to reduced grazing and smaller human population. So it's really interesting to learn what's going on with the Argani population there now and how to preserve it. From Karaganda, the researchers head towards the district center of Kankaralinsk. To get an understanding of the size of the Kazakh hummocks, let's speak into the Wikipedia. The area of Kakorali district is 35.5 thousand square kilometers, of 5 thousand square kilometers more than Belgium. The area of Karaganda region is 4,028 thousand square kilometers, that is 70 thousand square kilometers larger than Germany. What a vast space! The weather today is the best as it gets. Wind 25 meters per second and crispy. But we cannot avoid going for the count as we have only a couple of days to complete the work. Near the settlement of Yeginti Bulag, the expedition meets Almas Dalit Baev, director of the Severovostochne hunting farm, with a couple of rangers and Oleg Raptev, chief specialist of Karaganda Territorial Fauna Inspection. The farm operates under the national state enterprise responsible for protecting rare animal species. Okot Zoo Prom is doing protection, accounting, monitoring and forecasting of red-listed animal populations condition. The territorial forestry and fauna inspection is vested with control and supervision functions. These nature protection organizations are quite different, although they have a common task to preserve and expand the fauna of Kazakhstan. The weather is what it is. Just yesterday the guys were wearing shirts in Almaty. But here in the very heart of the Great Stamp, it's a totally different pair of shoes. During missions, Orkhods are prompt inspectors overnight in specially equipped vehicles that they jokingly call dance. We got lucky. Today with us we have Oleg Alekseevich Raptor, the chief specialist of the Karaganda Territorial Inspection. He will show us the key locations and tell us of what has happened to the local fauna in the course of the last 20 years. Red-listed animals like Argali and Saigon live on the territory of our region, in particular on the premises of the northeastern hunting farm. In fact, Saiga is not included in the Red Book, but is a specially protected species. As to Argali, its population has grown during the last 10 to 15 years. As of today, about 10 12,000 animals live in the region. Although we still don't have the data for this year, I believe that number did not fall. First of all, we need to mark the route of the upcoming counting on the maps. Stefan Mikkel, the head of the monitoring mission, is German but has spent quite some time in Central Asia during the last 20 years and is well versed in several languages of the region. My name is Stefan Mikkel and I am a biologist. I am a member of the IUCN Species Conservation Commission and work within the group of specialists on mountain-hoofed animals. The group focuses on preserving wild sheep and goats. Within the group, I am responsible for assessments on red-listed animals. Let's split into two groups. Okay, but let's stay together in the beginning to have the same numbers. Almaz Daulet Baev is a skilled biologist and game manager. He had worked as the monitoring group chief and also directed a national park. At present, he heads this model state hunting farm with aim to demonstrate the world best practices of animal resource management. 
The Severo Vostochnaya hunting farm occupies the area of 470,000 hectares and is located in the northeastern part of Kakorali district of Karaganda region. We can have two groups of three, four people. Usually one is writing, two are looking around and one is helping them. Stefan, we have chosen three mountain mesos for Montre, which correspond to the key areas where Ragali live. Akalek, Yedre and Mezek. In the morning, the group hits the road and heads towards the Yedre Mountains. Wild animal counts are not that easy as animals are extremely cautious and often lead a twilight way of life. Different wild animal monitoring techniques are used in different countries and they all have different admissible error thresholds meaning that it's impossible to count all wild animals in a given area precisely. In recent years, more and more countries are shifting towards the adaptive animal resource management system. Recognizing that they cannot give an exact number of animals in a population, scientists agree that it's not really important. What's much more important is to analyze the overall population's condition, that is, whether it's stable, growing or degrading. For this, one needs to know not only the number, but also the population's gender and age composition. A healthy population has the optimal ratio of males, females and cubs. Excessive population density in a given area may lead to epizootes. Vice versa, a population's scarcity can reduce the chances of males and females meeting each other leading to the irreversible population degradation. To facilitate interactions among the scientists of different countries, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, the organization responsible for the International Red List, has designed uniform techniques and designations to be used no matter where you are on the planet. The monitoring group logs all animals and birds seen on the route. From afar, the black points on the snow look like bushes, but they turn out to be a brood of black grouses. The birds are hiding from the wind behind the rock. The Yedre mountain oasis is the only remnant of an ancient volcano. The high folded mountains emerged here at the end of the Paleozoic age about 250 million years ago as a result of active volcanic processes. Yet even the biggest mountains cannot resist the destructive power of water, wind and time. Erosion has erased the mountains and turned Sariaka into the hilly steppe with granite inzertbergs towering over it here and there. The fertile soil has been accumulating gorges suitable for plant and animal communities. For millions of years, countless herds of mountain goats, bisons, gazelles, antelopes, camels, white horses and donkeys roamed the Great Steppe. Approximately in the second half of the third millennium BC, the human tribes living in this wealthy region had grown big and reached high level of development. They had mastered metallurgy, production of linen and woolen fabrics, they built dwellings and united in large military alliances. Hunting played an important role in the economy of the Bronze and Early Iron Ages. Excessive hunting could have been the main reason for the primeval biodiversity reduction. For thousands of years, people had been hunting without any restrictions, at times at a grandiose scale. Genghis Khan had two banks or high-ranking officials responsible for hunting, Bayan and Mingan. Mingan had 10,000 huntsmen dressed in red clothing. Bayan also had 10,000 huntsmen only dressed in blue. 
In the Middle Ages, in the Great Steppe, it was still possible to encounter the primitive buffalo, the wild horses, tarpons, and wild camels. Only in the 20th century, the Kazakhstan's fauna had lost two large cats, the Caspian tiger and cheetah. Only the most tolerant animal species have survived and adapted to the closeness of humans. The word tolerance came to politics from biology. Tolerant animal species are the ones able to quickly adapt to the changing conditions and first of all to anthropogenic exposure. For instance, foxes are a tolerant species and can dig their holes directly behind the village fence. A young fox cub is hunting on its own for the first time. The game is plenty, yet it's not so easy getting it. Practice makes perfect. Each grey partridge separately is an easy capture, but in a pack at least one bird will definitely notice an approaching predator and give an alarm signal. Partridges are social birds. In the fall, two three broods usually unite into one pack. As together it's not only easier to escape from predators, but also to look for food. Each bird closely watches its neighbor, and if it finds an area rich with goodies, the companions will join it immediately. A shared dinner definitely tastes better. Patridges don't like flying. If there is a chance of escaping without flying, they will run away and hide in grass or rock crevices. On the contrary, mountain goats are by far not tolerant. They like neither humans nor farm animals and try to go as far as possible into the free and uninhabited areas. When there were plenty of such places in the Great Steppe, the Argali felt okay. Their population started falling with a reducing number of such untouched areas. Nevertheless, the Argali turned out luckier than other now extinct species of hoofed animals. They managed to maintain their gene pool until the moment the humans realized their power and likewise responsibility of preserving the planet's biosphere. In the 20th century, they started establishing especially protected natural territories, wild nature islands left by humans to their minorities. We understood that it's necessary to more or less wisely follow the laws of nature and to try not to violate the fragile ecological equilibrium. Kazakhstan is currently working to correct the mistakes of the past. Our state introduces rare animals into the wild nature whose populations were one step from extinction. Bukhara deer or kangul, Asiatic wild ass and Przewalski's horse were all bred in special nurseries and wildlife reserves for subsequent release into the wild. At present, Mountain sheep or argali are not under threat and don't require breeding in open-air cages. It's enough to maintain their natural populations. Методика мониторинговых обследований. The technique of monitoring inspections is called root and area. The route is planned and is called transect. We use GPS to measure and mark its direction and length and then reflect it on the map. When we see animals, we measure the distance from the root line to that animal. Afterwards, we map these distances and it's possible to draw a conditional curved border and determine the area and the configuration of the monitored area. The expedition encounters small Argali groups of up to 20 animals. The largest herd amounted to 35 individuals. During one day, we registered about 170 mountain sheep in the Yedre Massive. 
which is quite a good indicator. The monitoring group is simultaneously counting farm animals to also map them and see the correlation between the concentrations of wild and agricultural animals. For example, it was noticed long ago that close to horse breeding locations there were more agave as opposed to areas with many sheep or cattle. It's believed that horses don't damage pastures, whereas sheep herds don't eat but tread down more grass. In addition, equine infectious diseases do not transmit to wild agave. The mountains of Yadre, Mejik and Dakalik are literally filled with monuments and evidence of the past, which means that the area has been densely inhabited since the most ancient times. This is the grave of Man Khan, our mother and the beloved daughter of our ancestor, the great Kazibek B, says the engraving. Kazibek Kaldibakuli was one of the authors of the Code of Laws called Jati Jagi, or the Seven Principles adopted during the reign of Tauke Khan. Among other things, the document referred to hunting and even stipulated for a special punishment for those who violate the hunting rule. Until today, the Kazakh culture contains multiple vivid expressions and words, poetic metaphors and comparisons associated with hunting and wild nature. Totanic animals like golden eagle, falcon, snow leopard, wolf, mountain sheep, argali and goited gazelle are found in many works of ancient art. For example, the golden plates of the famous golden man from the Isik Barrows are decorated with the image of the golden eagle attacking the mountain goat Take Care. In nomadic culture, hunting always symbolized liberty, freedom and firmness. In his book, Takiru Rashidi, Mirza Muhammad Kaida tells about how Babur, the founder of the Empire of the Great Mughals, led a free way of life in this step for a whole year. As per the customs of that time, before entering military service, young soldiers had to test themselves by spending some time in the wild, feeding on the game meat and keeping themselves warm with the skins of killed animals. In Turkic, the term was Kazakovat, and thus the inhabitants of the free border areas were called Kazakhs. Later, this Turkic term appeared in Russian in the form of Cossacks. The first laws regulating hunting appeared in the early Middle Ages. In the 13th century, a passionate hunter, Friedrich Goggenstaufen, declared death penalty for grazing pigs in royal oak groves. By the way, the relic oak groves in Europe have remained only within the hunting grounds. Friedrich was also the first author of hunting stories. In his book The Art of Falcon Hunting, for instance, he gave advice on the maintenance of hunting grounds. In the 12th century, Yaroslav the Wise also issued a decree regulating falconry rules. 200 years later, they established the first falcon picket in the Moscow suburbs. Now this area is called Sokolniki, yet the first nature protection laws did not have any direct environmental aims. The nobility merely tried to limit the access for commoners to wild animal resources, considering hunting an aristocratic privilege. Thus, the common folk's sympathies rested rather with a cheerful poacher Robin the Hood than with the Nottingham Sheriff. In the area called Ushkara, the expedition has accidentally come across the cave of Mahdi Bapiuli. Hiding from the imperial authorities, the famous Kazakh poet had Kazakhed in the Yedre Mountains for several years. In his creative works, the nature and hunting are closely linked with the ideas of freedom. This artifact apparently belongs to a much later time. Who had brought this plaster eagle to the godforsaken gorge in the middle of the Mizik Mountains? Could it have some connection with a testing site? It's only 20 kilometers away. A crater in the middle of the gorge. It was an explosion. Were it geologists looking for something or the military? 
Perhaps somebody knows the answer to this question, but we prefer to leave the place as quickly as possible following the Argali traces. For many millennia, people took from nature everything they wanted, and only in the second half of the 20th century, we have suddenly realized that natural resources are not infinite. And if we don't limit our appetites, we will soon find ourselves in a lifeless desert. The 20th century marked the drastic change in our relation towards untouched, primitive landscapes. Earlier, the wild was considered dangerous and hostile to humans, but a wide group of great writers, artists, scientists, philosophers and public figures had managed to instill it in the minds and hearts of the whole concerned humankind that the wild nature is the greatest treasure which we must preserve at any cost. Previously, we considered wild animals only a food source, but gradually the culture and art have taught us to see the aesthetic value of the wild. Wild animals animate landscapes, turning a boring trip into a fascinating journey. An opportunity to see wild animals has been turning into a new profitable business, ecotourism. Before lunch, we have covered roughly one-third of the Yedre Massif and have registered about 100 animals. In the summer, the mountains of Yedre are mainly occupied by male Argali, while females generally go to the Argalic. Roughly in mid-October, they come together in mixed herds. A group of male Argalis moving towards the mountains of Arkalik, which probably points to the approaching mating season. Reproduction is a complicated and mutually synchronized in time and space set of behavioral reactions. For thousands of years, evolution has been forging mating rituals mandatory for each Argali willing to manifest themselves in future generations. In the course of the next three weeks, Argali males will be in constant movement, thinking of neither food nor sleep, pursuing females and entering into ritual duels. The remains of the dead male Argali point to the age group of 10 to 12 years. Why so? The senior males, weakened by rotting and fights, become an easy catch for wolves or die due to exhaustion, having fulfilled their biological mission. In the course of several mating seasons, they have managed to pass on their genes. We've spent only four days in the mountains of Kakoreli district, although it seems an eternity. We've managed to see so much new. The farm is quite impressive. They have a very good potential and we are happy about the number of Argali that we saw. I honestly thought we should be lucky to see 800 animals, but in the course of four days we saw about 800. It's very good. It's obvious that the huntsmen in your farm are very motivated people. I want to emphasize that the locals who have their winterings here, for these coming from the nearby small towns like Kakaralinsk, are not protecting animals because they were told so and get paid. They really mean it. They really love the nature of Kazakhstan and their local land with all their hearts. Our organization, Okodzo Prom, has secured this farm because these are the key Argali habitats. I would like to thank the hunting farm and especially its head, Almas Dalit Baev, and his huntsmen for accompanying and helping us in the course of these four days. In the mud, in the snow, through water and through rocks. We were accepted so well in the lodge. 
The welcome was really warm and not only in the sense of actual temperature. First of all, it felt really kind and warm. Thank you. The first phase of monitoring is over. Field data will need to undergo laboratory processing. It will be mapped and put into graphs and figures. As to the expedition, it's moving ahead to eastern Kazakhstan region.